Yeah. Nice ties. Everyone dressed nice for the mayor's debate. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ted Henley from Breakfast Television on City. Thank you for letting me leave my show early this morning to get involved with this. I got an extra hour off air, which is great to hang out with you guys. Uh, welcome to the mayoral debate. Uh, six of nine candidates, thank you to all of you for coming in this morning, embracing this chance to, to chat with the youth of Calgary, also known as future voters in Calgary. Uh, next election, four years from now, you guys will be uh, casting ballots, which is great. Um, I'd like to thank Youth Central and Ian Basiljet for all the hard work. How about a round of applause for Youth Central and Ian Basiljet? Great, great organizing skills getting this together, which is awesome. A big welcome to everyone watching live online. You guys are being streamed across the city right now. Lots of people, hundreds of people watching this debate, which is uh, fantastic. Of course, the big question, why are we holding a, a forum for youth, but not only the future voters, but you guys do care, and I know that. I have three uh, young kids who care deeply about what's happening in the city of Calgary. They asked their dad, all the time over dinner why certain things are being done or not done in some cases in the city, which is great. Uh, how about a big round of applause for Will? Will is going to be our official timekeeper, grade eight, right, my friend? Will is a big official timekeeper for this morning, which is excellent. Um, there's, there are going to be uh, three rounds of questioning. Uh, one of the rounds is going to involve two students, uh, so you don't have to listen to my voice, thankfully, so much. Uh, the two students, thank you for stepping up today. Going to ask a couple of really great questions. All these questions, by the way, uh, coming up with a youth or coming in with a youth focus, which is perfect for you guys. I'm just going to introduce the table in front of us this morning, and, and then we'll get cracking if, if you guys want to get to this. Uh, starting at the, my left, so the far stage left here. A uh, round of applause, please, for uh, Larry Heather. Milan Pepez, Carter Thompson, Nahed Nenshi, John Lord, and Norm Perot. As I mentioned, six of the nine candidates running for mayor in this civic election. Thank you all for coming in this morning. Um, we might as well get cracking. I'll let you know that during the each round, each, each candidate gets two minutes to answer the questions. Um, in the second round of questioning, they get to use a uh, rebuttal trump card, if they so wish. And uh, I will try to remember, uh, you guys, to, uh, to ask for the, if there anyone wants to rebut to answers. Uh, but let's get going, I guess. Will, are you ready for this? Uh, each candidate in the first round here is going to get two minutes to answer this question as kind of an opening remark type of thing. Um, so, Will, you're good to go? We're excellent here? Awesome. Oh, I should mention, uh, Will's going to ring the bell once when there's 30 seconds left in the candidate's answer, and then he's gonna ring it twice uh, for the candidate to uh, finish speaking, and then if I have to kind of wrangle, I guess I will, if, if you guys are going on a little bit past that. Um, so, okay, so let's get going. And you might as well start with Larry Heather on the far left side of the stage here, just keeping it simple. And the question is, please, Larry, uh, your answer to, the city of Calgary is growing. What challenges will the young people of today face 10 years in the future? Oh, Larry, sorry, the microphone right there. Yes. Right there, yeah, there you go. Good morning, everybody. Good. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Larry Heather. I'm candidate for the mayor of Calgary. You can see my website at larryforcalgary.ca. That's larryforcalgary.ca, where my beliefs and policies are fully outlined. I am your mayoralty best choice for free enterprise with car mobility, social conservatism, and a Christian choice on the ballot. If I was elected, I'd be the 36th Christian mayor of Calgary. Um, this past weekend was thank, or this uh, weekend is Thanksgiving, and we can thank God for the blessings He has given us as Calgarians. Our energy resources in Alberta are a divine gift that has brought us prosperity and blessing, and a lot of your future is going to be in the oil connected in some way in the oil resource. Uh, sector. Unfortunately, the ungrateful and unthankful have a way of twisting things out of perspective through phony environmentalism. There hasn't been any global warming for 15 years. Or misplaced sympathies like putting a dog's head on a turkey and saying, would you eat your dog? I don't know if any of you have seen those uh, billboards yet, but uh, that's kind of strange. Uh, one of the problems you're going to have in 10 years is that you may be forming families pretty soon, and you're going to be concerned about bullying. And I would ask you to check out that the 
the creation science option on the internet to balance off with what you're getting in environmental uh, evolution because God created us and that gives us a basis for respecting one another, not survival of the fittest ethic. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, the, second, the second person to answer, just to remind you all the question again, the question is, uh, the city of Calgary is growing. What challenges will the young people of today face 10 years in the future? Uh, Milan Pepet. Yeah, I remember one of the candidates which are promoting uh, political change in our society, which starts from provincial government and goes to the federal government. And over the last decade or so, we see completely increase for the students from the grade one up to the universities. And many countries around the world providing this education for free. When I'm talking to students at the university, they're saying what our society is going to do for our loans. They are extreme when we finish studies. We suffer the burden for maybe a decade to pay the loans off. So I would like to promote within a political arena in Alberta to provide a free education even for the students in university. If people in China can afford it, we can afford it in Canada. And that, that would be my major objective. And on the other hand, uh, its uh, teachers are also subject of uh, kind of elimination from the work and not being paid enough. And I think that education is the number one thing for the country. We had lots of immigrants coming to our country, so we didn't really need that, that much education and paid that much attention. But immigration is decreasing right now, and we should or spend more money on education because we're going to be short of the people to, in our society to provide uh, services from university education especially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pepez. Uh, next, up, next up, rather, is uh, Carter Thompson. And Carter, the city of Calgary is growing. What challenges will the young people of today face 10 years in the future? Thanks for having me, folks. Uh, that, that's definitely a great question. I think that uh, there's a lot of talk, topic about the growth of our city. I think we're growing it the wrong way. We are using up arable farmland when we could be building our new developments on rock and gravel to the west of the city and saving our farmland for growing. So I think we need to take a hard look at how we're doing things. We need to get the city on the move better and get the transit so everybody can get around. You guys are the future and you guys will have a big part and a big say in how that we can revamp our transportation system to better serve our city. Our recreational facilities need to be maximized so that we use our resources, use them wisely, and, and, and save money so that we get big bang for the buck, and that's a big deal. We need to get really good bang for our buck. So uh, thanks, you guys. Thank you, Carter. Uh, the question, uh, next, Nahed Nenshi is next. The question again, uh, Mr. Nenshi, the city of Calgary is growing. What challenges will young people of today face 10 years in the future? Well, thank you very much. And first of all, let me say uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I had no idea we had such well-dressed kids at uh, Ian Baz School here. And I'm sure the hundreds of people watching uh, on the live stream are as well. And I really want to say thank you to Ian Bazaljet, to Mr. Shivji and the team uh, for putting this event on. Uh, it is a great opportunity for us to have some dialogue with young people. And I'll tell you, for me, it's very personally meaningful. I grew up very close to this school. Uh, in fact, my cousin had a shop in the strip mall across the street. And as someone who grew up in East Calgary and is in this position now, I think I understand that we have something very special in this community that a lot of places in the world don't have. And that is simply this, that we can say that every single kid in every single corner of this community, regardless of what they look like or where their family came from or how much money they have or how they worship, that every single kid in every single corner of this community has the opportunity right here to live a great Canadian life. And that is a special thing. It is not true in most places in the world. 
And I'm focused on making sure that every day we're fulfilling the promise of that community, that we're making sure that every single one of you, 10 years from now, will have the opportunity to do whatever you want to do. And that means investing in public infrastructure. The city doesn't look after public education, but we can look after a lot of the things that support that. I spent most of my Saturday afternoons at the Forest Lawn Library, not far from here. Public libraries, parks, recreation facilities. I learned to swim at the Bob Bahan pool, not very well. All of these things are the things that we need to invest in to make sure that every single child has the opportunity to succeed in our community. And that's what we need to continue to do. We need to continue to make sure that this is a place of boundless opportunity, that it's a place that welcomes people from everywhere and allows people the chance through public systems to live a great life. And if I'm re-elected, that is precisely what I will do. I've been working hard to fulfill that promise and I'll keep doing that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Nenshi. Uh, John Lord is next. John, the city of Calgary is growing. What challenges will young people of today face 10 years in the future? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to see so many of you here and taking an interest in this election. I own Casablanca Video, a small business that's been there for 31 years. So I know how to run small businesses and save pennies in order to keep the business alive and growing. I said, I've also got nine years of experience in government, three times more than he does. Just by a show of hands, how many people think it's really important for a mayor of a city to have a lot of experience in how government works? Does anyone think that would be important? Thank you. So why am I running? I said, you know, this isn't about me. This is actually all about you. I am very worried about your futures. That's why I'm doing this. And what I see going on at City Hall has me so concerned for your futures that I just had to run. I couldn't sit by. I said, there is money going out in every direction. We've just sent money overseas when we have starving artists here in Calgary. Are you going to be given the opportunities here in Calgary that you should have and could have if we keep spending money like this at City Hall? Your taxes have gone up 30% in three years, and you're the ones that are going to have to pay for all those bills. Just by a show of hands, does anyone here, uh, have you ever heard your parents talking about how much things cost? Are they worried about money? Are they worried about the cost of living in Calgary? Just by a show of hands, go ahead. Have you heard people talking about that? Okay, this is your future that we're talking about here. The cost of living in Calgary is going through the roof and it's going to get worse if we keep having this kind of situation at City Hall. It's all coming from City Hall. And the reality is that Edmonton is growing just as fast as we are, almost, but their costs aren't going this high. When you go to buy a new home in Edmonton, its costs haven't gone up anywhere near as much. It's coming from the decisions at City Hall. How many people, by a show of hands, think that someday they might want to own a house and raise a family? It's going to be so expensive, I'm worried you might not be able to afford it. We have to change what's going on at City Hall. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lord. <clears throat> uh, just a reminder, guys, the, the first bell means you have 30 seconds left, and the second bell from Will here means that you, uh, that's your two minutes up. Uh, Norm, you're next up here, and uh, the city of Calgary is growing. Norm, what challenges will the young people of today face 10 years in the future? Actually, there's a, a very serious problem, and a lot of people don't think about it, and I think you guys should. Taxes will take more than half your paycheck. By the time you pay for federal tax, provincial tax, and your property taxes, that's a big chunk. But then you're also paying for cigarette tax, booze tax, gas tax, tax on top of tax. You go, small businesses have to increase their prices because of the tax. Phone small businesses yourself and ask them. Don't ask a politician, ask them about taxation. After this, then with what's left, which is probably less than 50 cents on the dollar, you're going to be trying to buy a house, mortgage, insurance, food, paying off student loans, everything. Wow. You know, it's wrong, especially when the money is being wasted. And I mean wasted. Whenever there's a project that is being done, like building a bridge or whatever, then they come along and they say, oh, cost plus, cost override, cost whatever excuse. You students are past the excuse part, so you understand. 
Don't let them give you excuses. Stand up for yourselves and let's get big value for your dollar. Bang for your buck. And if this continues to happen, we're going to be like Detroit. Detroit is actually bankrupt because of their city council. It drove their industry to, the, to Mexico. Don't let it happen. Okay, thank you, Norm. All right, so that, that's the end of round one of questioning. Uh, round two, I have drawn uh, two groups of three names from the, the silver bowl up front here, and uh, each candidate in round two in the three separate groups will get to answer the questions that I uh, read here this morning. Each candidate gets two minutes to answer. We'll hear the three people from each group, and then uh, each candidate gets one chance to use that rebuttal trump card I was talking about earlier. I'll try to remember to ask, but please let the three people answer first, then you get your chance to rebut, and remind, uh, remind you guys that the rebuttal is one minute. Okay, and again, Will's gonna, Will's gonna ring with 30 seconds to go, and then the double ring uh, means the two minutes, yeah? How I'm gonna try and get this round of questioning to go till about 10.20, which gives us a good chunk of time here, so we're gonna try and get through a few, which will be uh, kind of covering a wide spectrum of issues here, which should be great. So uh, just for your information, and everyone uh, here, and also watching uh, online, uh, Group A will be Milan Papez, John Lord, and Nahed Nenshi. Group B, Carter Thompson, Larry Heather, and Norm Perot. Uh, I'm gonna go in that order, guys, and then when we flip to the next time you guys are answering, I'll just reverse it to keep it fair, okay? Uh, so group A, again, it's gonna be Milan Papez, John Lord, and Nahed Nenshi, and the question, are you ready to go, Will? You're doing a great job, by the way, Will. Really great job. Okay, so this uh, question is gonna first go to Milan Papez. You'll have two minutes to answer. Then John Lord will answer, Nahed Nenshi will answer, and then, as I mentioned, you can rebut, but you only get one rebuttal in this round, okay? It's your only rebuttal in the whole debate today. So just so you know, use it wisely. Okay, so Milan, uh, question number one. Again, you have two minutes to answer. If elected as mayor, what would you do to make the city more accessible for disabled citizens? Be, oh, don't forget the microphone, Milan. Actually, at the present, yep. at the present time, we're actually doing a climate for the uh, disabled citizens, but we're still not able to provide the complete services. These people always depend waiting for the service because there is uh, not enough uh, equipment to move these people around, buses and so on. But uh, there is lots of buildings which uh, doesn't allow the access. So I would promote within the city and especially within the construction and especially of the new building, make this building more accessible for the disabled people and uh, also we have uh, buses right now which uh, can take disabled people but not all of them are suitable uh, to be used so we still need the more buses in the city which would be available for uh, disabled people as well second second thing uh, would be uh, we should have uh, access uh, especially on the streets. We have lots of uh, roads which uh, make it uh, very difficult for the disabled uh, people to make it across the street, make it across the sidewalk. And I believe that this would be one of the most important things is to improve infrastructure on the roads so the people which uh, don't have a capacity like we, we can run across the street, they are able to do that. We have many people we can see on the road that they cannot make it in time on the other side of the road because the road is in a very poor condition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. <laughs> Second person answer in uh, Group A is John Lord. John, if elected as mayor, what would you do to make the city more accessible for disabled citizens? Thank you. You know, I've always said that any city's greatest asset is its people. If you can help your people to achieve their, their best and their, the most they're able to do, then you're doing a good job. And our disabled people in Calgary have great talents, but they're, they're having a tough time getting an opportunity to show what they can do. So one of the first things I did when I was first elected years ago was I started an initiative to help them earn more money through working at home on their computers, teleworking. There's all kinds of jobs that people could do working at home on their computers. They could be doing jobs at City Hall. They could have good paying jobs working at home on their computers. And I think we really need to promote that 
because that would lead to disabled people in Calgary having a lot more money, and that would solve so many other problems for them. In addition to that, I voted to increase funding for Handybus back then and disabled services, and I also knew that the taxi companies in town wanted, they wanted to be able to do more in terms of providing taxi services, but the city wasn't helping them. The city didn't want to have more taxi services, I guess. They wanted to put it all on handy bus. And I said, well, you know, we need as much as we can get, and if the private sector was willing to step up, why would we not allow a whole bunch more of that? So there's many opportunities for disabled people to have more access, to get elsewhere. We've got to have more vehicles on the road. Is that 30 seconds? 30 to go, yeah. yeah. We've got to have more vehicles on the road so they can get around. We have to do things like make sure that when the uh, LRT comes downtown, there isn't two inches between the platform and the car so they can't get uh, a wheelchair across there. Uh, there's just a number of little things that need to be done like that, but at the end of the day, if we could get people jobs working at City Hall and elsewhere at home on their computers so they could earn a lot more money, that would really, really make a difference in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, this, uh, this is the last question, by the way, the Group A, and then you guys do have the chance to rebut if you choose to do so. Um, the question, uh, Nahed Nenshi, is if elected as mayor, what would you do to make the city more accessible for disabled citizens? So as mayor, I work with a group called the Advisory Committee on Accessibility, terrible name, uh, a group of people with disabilities who tell the city how we can do a better job. And we work a lot on big issues. Uh, the biggest issue is one that's called universal design. And what universal design means is that design that's for everybody. It's not just for people with disabilities or people who are able-bodied. It's design that works for everybody. So to give you an example, we've just ordered a new series of buses. And when those buses arrive next year and we retire some of the older buses from the fleet, every single bus in our fleet will be low floor, no steps, uh, which will make it easier for everyone, uh, people with disabilities, people with strollers, people without disabilities, to be able to access transit. So we're slowly starting to get there. I will tell you, though, that when I talk to the people on the Advisory Committee on Accessibility, and I talk to just people with mobility disabilities in any case, it's the little things that really matter. We have curb cuts in many parts of the city that almost seem like afterthoughts. So when you're crossing the street at a curb cut, you have to make a big zigzag to get to the curb cut on the other side. They don't line up. So as we're starting to refresh our infrastructure in the city, we're doing that with universal accessibility in mind, or universal design in mind uh, for everyone. And then finally, for folks who can't access regular transit or that kind of mobility, we do have a service called Access Calgary, which uh, John was referring to. Um, the challenge with Access Calgary is as our population gets older, the demand is really going up. And I really would like, if I'm re-elected, to look at ways of using new technology and new ideas uh, to improve the dispatch, to allow people to use Access Calgary more. One of the first things I did when I was mayor was to uh, urge council to reverse the decision to cut Access Calgary. I think that that is a very important service uh, and one that we need to continue and figure out how to expand. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nation. Um, does anyone care to use their rebuttal right now? Or are you going to hang on to it for a bit? No, no rebuttals? Okay, great. We'll move on to Group B then. Group B is a reminder, Carter Thompson, Larry, Heather, Norm Perot, in that order. And uh, are you ready to go, Will? All right. And so the question to Group B, if you are to become mayor of the city of Calgary, how would you handle a budget surplus like the $52 million recently? First up is uh, Carter Thompson. Thank you. Uh, my stance is very clear. The, that surplus money that was refunded from the province, that was the tax room, should have rolled right back up to the ratepayers who paid it. So the portion that the ratepayers would pay would be returned to them every single time, instead of just returning it to general revenues to, to waste. Simple as that. That's all I got. OK, thank you, Carter. Uh, Larry Heather. Larry, if you were to become the mayor of Calgary, how would you handle a budget surplus like the recent $52 million? Well, I'm walking along the street here, and I, I see a wallet lane there, and I say, wow, you know, I, ooh, yeah, that's $3,000 in here. That's pretty good, you know. Um, anybody watching? I think I'll just, yeah, I, no. Something called my conscience says, 
hey, this belongs to somebody else. I should give it back to them. And if they want to give it back to the city hall in a donation, that's fine. But let's not steal people's money. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Norm Perot, if you are to become the mayor of Calgary, how would you handle a budget surplus like the recent $52 million? Well, the thing is, it looks like the city wants to take the money out of my pocket and all of yours also, your parents. If I was mayor, I promise I will not embezzle your money, your $52 million. Now, the thing is, that money should be given back to the people that it belongs to. If they are not struggling, if they've got lots of money to waste, then by all means, give it to the flood relief, to the manager's 4.1 million overtime pay, whatever, excuses again. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that needs to stop. And I mean, somebody should be really held accountable for this. Not just words. They say talk is cheap. Well, it's not. There's 52 millions that they're talking us out of. Hot air. Don't allow that stuff. Stand up. Raise. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Okay, for the, oh, sorry, does anyone want to use a rebuttal card? No rebuttals? Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next round. Uh, just reversing, uh, so we're going back to Group A, but it'll be uh, Nahed Nenshi, John Lord, and then Milan Papez. Just reversing the order, guys. Um, so, okay, here we go. Uh, Nahed Nenshi, what efforts will you take to make the city more environmentally friendly if elected mayor? So when we think about what the city can impact in terms of environment, there are three areas. There's land, there's air, and there's water. So in terms of land, the most important thing we do, uh, there's two important things we do. The first is garbage and recycling and waste collection. Uh, and I'm pleased that Council has moved to a world where we will have curbside organics over the course of the next term. In other words, you'll have three bins instead of two. Um, but we'll be able to remove more and more from the landfill to compost the organics uh, and create fertilizer. The second and most important thing is handling the city's environmental footprint in terms of our size. The city is very, very large. We are as big as New York City with one-tenth of the population. So we need to start having a more balanced view on growth, start to build up in areas where we can uh, move people by transit, where recreation facilities and schools are nearby, and that'll make a huge difference in terms of our land use. In terms of air, we're making major investments in Calgary Transit, as well as in alternative forms of transportation like cycling and walking, all of which will help to reduce air pollution. In terms of water, there's something that you probably don't know, which is that the city of Calgary is world-renowned for how well we deal with water conservation and how well we deal with the water system. There are more than a billion people in the world who don't have access to safe, clean drinking water every day. And the fact that we 100% of the time can turn on the tap and have safe, clean water is amazing. And we also use, as Calgarians, as much water today as we used 20 years ago, even though we have such a larger population, because we've done a great job on investing in ensuring that we have water conservation and the very best water treatment in the world. So transit, limiting urban sprawl, organics recycling, and doing even better on water conservation. Okay. Thank you, Nahed uh, John Lord, John, you're up next. What efforts will you take to make the city more environmentally friendly, John, if you're elected mayor? Well, thank you for the question, because this is a very important issue for me, and has been for many years. I said, you know, it's, it, talk is really nice, but it's action that counts. Uh, it's looking at what people have actually done and achieved that's all that really counts. And I'm a guy who actually walks my talk. When I was first on council, I brought a motion called ISO 14000. It's already complicated. But essentially, it was the world's best environmental management system. And I brought it to transform the culture of City Hall to start looking at the environment. Start looking at how we do everything in the city from an environmental standpoint. That motion took a long time to get, to get going. The pilot project actually recovered its half million dollar cost in four months. That's the kind of savings it also produced while looking at 
doing things from an environmentally responsible manner. And ultimately, that motion transformed the city of Calgary right across the city of Calgary to, so that we won a world environmental achievement award for, for being the most environmentally responsible and progressive government of any municipal government on the planet. It's called Enviro System. You can look it up on the web. It's what the city of Calgary does as their policy today. I'm really proud of that motion. It took hundreds and hundreds of people at City Hall to really put it into place. But that's the kind of leadership that I would bring to City Hall again. You know, we can do more of that. The, rea the reality is that there are so many things we could be doing. And when I brought all of this stuff, the environment wasn't that popular. I was kind of out there by myself. It was really pushing a rock uphill. Our landfills, I was told we have a 100-year supply of landfill. I studied landfills, I looked at systems, I realized we could recycle 100% and make money doing it if we brought in the best technology. Why not? Why aren't we doing it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Milan Papez, uh, what efforts would you take to make the city more environmentally friendly if elected mayor? Uh, number one thing was that in, when we first started to build the sea terrain, everything was built for the main reason to protect our environment. And it was decided that we're going to finish this project as quickly as possible. So we're going to eliminate the pollution on our streets. In fact, all the politicians which has gone involved in the development of LRT, whether it came from the province, federal government, or the city, they totally failed to develop that project. Now, today, as you're going to look at yourself, every street is traffic jam, pollution. You go Deerfoot, Croftchild, you go wherever you go, even downtown, you cannot even move. And this project was neglected. And I would especially say the present city council, led by Professor Nenci, they, instead of completing a project of the sea train, they went to build a tunnel and the airport, which we don't need. And I think that we have to concentrate right now to complete sea train website across the city so we can move from one place to the other and don't have to use the cars. We have too many cars, and in fact, if you look at the situation right now, we cannot put any more cars on the road, and nobody's doing anything about it. So my major objective would be to provide sea train service as was originally planned to do, because that's the only way to transport the people across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. Um, Larry, did you want to rebut? Re reminder, you only get one rebuttal, so you'd like to do now? Okay, so Larry, will he's going to get one minute to do a rebuttal here. Are you ready, Larry? Yes. Okay, go ahead. It's a very important question, but from the perspective of the first book of Genesis, we are not to be worship wor worshipers of creation, we're to be stewards of creation. So some people have environmentalism as a replacement religion, and they like to play Messiah thinking they're saving the earth. But we have a, a mayor who has fundraised for the Pembina Institute, which is an anti-oil institute. So to promote a Pembina plan to suppress our oil resources in the name of so-called greenhouse gas reduction, and then paying $340,000 for it. I, as the mayor of Calgary, the oil capital of Canada, will not re proceed with this nonsense. It's like a chicken being asked to give a testimonial for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Just, it's crazy. Okay, thank you, Larry. Uh, were there any more rebuttals for the environmental question? You want to, Norm? Oh, you have two? <laughs> that's, that's for the mystery guest beside you, the other one there. Okay, so that's it for, uh, and we're going to move back to the group B. It'll be uh, Norm, Norm, you'll be first this time, Norm Perot, then Larry, Heather, Carter, Thompson. Uh, so Norm, uh, this is for you. What is the biggest change you wish to make for Calgary if elected mayor? Well, the thing is, if uh, city council gets back in the way it is now, we're going to bankrupt you because... It appears like it's going to be 40% in four years increase. So don't uh, take this lying down because bankruptcy is a very harsh pill. Now, money can be spent wisely. 
In other words, like I said before, don't allow these bridges or whatever to go cost plus, cost override, cost excuses. You know, the thing is, there's ways of getting things done cheaper. I've done without, and I've always managed to get by with what I had. Make do with what you have. Don't expect to be entitled to taxpayers' money. Don't waste it. It's not a, a bottomless pit. So whenever you're, if this, in other words, if this council gets back in, I predict that you guys are going to be bankrupt before you get started. That is wrong. And all the talk about water from other countries, whatever, I know it's a problem, but let's deal with our problems here and not use other places as excuses. It's like saying city taxes are lower than some other place. Well, why don't they compare this city to where the taxes are the lowest instead of the highest and govern themselves according to that? Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Uh, Larry, you're next. Larry Heather. And the question for you, Larry, is what is the biggest change you wish to make for Calgary if elected mayor? I want to make Calgary car friendly again, and that includes the downtown core. Uh, Seventy percent of your parents drive their cars, and they don't do it just because they want to burn gas. They do it because your lives are far more complex than any city planner downtown can even imagine. Your parents might be picking you up for soccer, dropping you off for dance class. Your parents might be going outside of the core to a vital business contact or volunteering themselves in one of the many organizations in Calgary. This is what makes Calgary a dynamic city, the ability to get around to every portion of the city. So I, the, the cost of parking downtown Calgary is higher than even Manhattan, I understand, or close to it. So it's ridiculous. We have the largest landmass country, the second largest, in the whole of the world. We have space to grow. We have space to park downtown, too. We can park with the new automated parking parkades. We can get twice or two and a half times the amount of cars in if we would just build them than the traditional ramp parking. So I want you guys, when you get driving, I want you to be able to access all of Calgary and not pay an arm and a leg to park somewhere just because you want to go down and support your friend's music recital or your, your friend's theater production. I want you to get around Calgary and we can do it. Is that? You still have about 25 seconds. Oh, okay. Uh, the mayor of Calgary should diligently seek to work with Calgary Council to serve the actual mobility needs of Calgarians. The fact is the lives of our Calgarians are too complex for somebody down in City Hall. And we are an oil producing province. Let's use the gas and let's prosper the economy here. Uh, it's not that bad. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Carter, Carter Thompson, you're next here. Carter, what is the biggest change you wish to make for Calgary if elected mayor? First and foremost, tax wisely. Back to the bang for the buck. Let's get the city moving. Let's fix transit. We've got the buses. We've got the streets. Let's get some smart routes to get people to work. Not everybody goes downtown. The only way transit works really well for you is if you're going downtown, you need to hit an industrial area and get to work at 5 a.m. Good luck, because sometimes there's just no buses. Let's get the city out of the taxi business. They don't belong there. Let free enterprise decide how to use a paid service and then that will fix it. You can't even get through on the taxi phone when you try to phone them. Yet they call these people stakeholders. We need to fix it. Smart traffic solutions. There, there's, we've been wasting so much money, we could have fixed so many places where traffic is choked off. We need smarter solutions to riding bicycles instead of choking off major arteries for bicycles and it's just plain dangerous. If the road's a little bit icy and the cars are moving fast, it's scary. We are Calgary, we can make made in Calgary solutions. We're not New York. We don't need to compare with New York. Go to Central Park, you can't even hide behind a tree. We have wonderful green spaces. So let's use our Calgary resources. 
We'll fix the transit. A prime example too with uh, traffic is we have these wonderful overpasses, yet these guys put lights on them. I, I can't figure out why you just can't put a little roundabout thingy on there and, and, and let's move the traffic. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Carter. Um, anyone, anyone like to use the rebuttal to any of those answers? No? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, back to the Group A here, and it's going to be starting with uh, Milan Papez this round, then John Lord, then Nahed Nenshi. And the question is, Milan, uh, recently the new Black Centre closed a youth venue with youth bands. As mayor, if elected, what will you do to make sure there are all ages venues in the city? Now that's uh, very complicated, especially in the present situation when we suffer a shortage of the money due to the flats and everything else. But uh, I would use the over every possible financing available to provide these services for the youth because actually you are our future and we it should be our first responsibility to make sure that you will be able to get the education to get uh, exercises in, in uh, athletic facilities so you can take over uh, our society when our generation will retire. And uh, I think that this uh, was always, historically, everywhere, uh, our youth were number one to be taken care of. And I think that this is, again, the lack of our politician, which making cuts to the education, making cuts on every corner. And we have to change this politics. We have to change these politicians, which are totally ignorant to our, our needs. So generally speaking, it would start it from the financing from the province and from the city to provide the services for you to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. Uh, John, you're next. John Lord, recently the new Black Centre closed a youth venue with youth bands. As mayor, if elected, what would you do to make sure there are all ages venues in the city? Well, thank you. And I said earlier that really I'm doing this for all of you because I'm very concerned about what's going on and what the city is uh, spending their money on instead of spending it on things that are going to help you. I said, in the last election, I put forward a plan to build 20 indoor year-round sports arenas for soccer, for hockey, for everything else. We had the money and we could have had that now, but we don't. Where's the money going? Well, we have a big blue circle on the highway. Just by a show of hands, how many of you can use that big blue circle on the highway? Any, any of that helping you at all to have activities, sports, soccer, all of these things you could be doing? So there's the concern. The money is going in directions that isn't going to help you, the money that's being spent is coming right out of your family's pocket. Every dime your parents have to send in taxes to City Hall is money that they could have had, you could have had, and you could be spending it on things that, are, that really matter to you. You know, it's so important that we have activities and opportunities for our young people. And we're just not getting that now because all the money is being spent in City Hall, taxes up 30%, but actually the, ta the cost of City Hall is now going right through the roof. It's more than double, almost triple what it was only a few short years ago. We have to stop that because that's money that you're going to have to pay back when you get older. I think it's just critical, frankly, uh, that we start looking at where the money's going and why we don't have these youth facilities. Uh, you know, I've helped so many different things in my life with money out of my own pocket to help get things that, that matter to young people, that matter to everyone. Charities, volunteer organizations, uh, all of these sorts of things need to be fostered, not squelched by City Hall red tape, not stepped on. The reason that facility closed, they don't have enough money to keep going. That's, that's the reality. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Nahed Nenshi, recently the new Black Center closed a youth venue with youth bands. As mayor, what will you do if elected to make sure there are all ages venues in the city? So uh, I'll try to be novel and actually answer the question. So 
I was uh, very disappointed to hear of the demise of the new Black Center, as well as the problems that the Dare to Dream Center, another all-ages venue in the city, uh, are having. The situations are very different. In the case of the new Black Center, uh, it was a privately run uh, organization, no government money, and he just couldn't make a go of it. Uh, and I don't think it's the city's job to subsidize private business that way. Uh, and it's too bad uh, that he was unable to make a go of it. In Dare to Dream, there are some issues that the city uh, needs to deal with because they weren't properly permitted for that work and we have to uh, try and get that done. Now the interesting thing about all ages venues is that they're difficult to run as a business because, well, they're all ages and you can't sell alcohol. And the folks who uh, run music venues make a lot of money off of their bar sales. So I'm not sure that there's a huge role for the city to play in actually funding these things, but I think what we can do is help facilitate bands and those in the music scene to better use existing facilities that aren't used at the times that you want to have all ages shows. So things like school gyms, recreation centers, and so on. Uh, this city is in fact building four new recreation centers, uh, three here in southeast Calgary, one in northwest Calgary, uh, all, of whom will, all of which will have multi-purpose rooms that you can use for facilities like this. So I think that custom-made all-ages venues that run seven days a week, we've shown they just can't make a go of it, they can't make a go with the money. But we can look at better using existing community facilities to make sure that bands have a place to play and people who are not yet 18 have a place to go and enjoy live music. Thank you, Nahed. Um, that's it for the Group A answers. Uh, any rebuttals? Nope, no rebuttals. Okay, we'll move on. This is Group B. Uh, the order is going to be Carter, Thompson, Larry, Heather, Norm, Perot. Uh, Carter, the question's going to you here. Uh, Calgary is a city that is growing quite quickly. Do you see having to raise taxes with all of the infrastructure needs? The word that I've heard from the development community is they're willing to front all the money to put everything in the ground to develop. All, the, all they want is the land so that there can be reasonable choices and with enough choice there could be competition and that should bring down our artificially high priced real estate that Calgary has now. It's very hard for a young family to afford to buy a house. So if we work more carefully with the developers and do get them, they will pay the money. So if it costs five or six thousand dollars more for a house, they're saying, bring it on. We'll just we'll tax that money or we'll, we'll attach the money at the tail end of the mortgage and the homeowner's going to be paying for it. That's just the way it goes. So as long as we grow smart and I get back to the point where I think the city should be growing west and not wasting farmland. So I think we really need to think of our environmental stewardship in that matter as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. Uh, Larry Heather, this one's to you. Uh, Calgary is a city that is grow growing quite quickly. Do you see having to raise taxes with all of the infrastructure needs? Not if we restrain some of the money that's being spent in other areas. Uh, Nahid's uh, favorite vision plan is Imagine Calgary 100, and that was instituted in the city planning in 2006. He was the principal writer. In that uh, document has this statement, uh, by the year 2020, I believe this is a good quote, uh, every immigrant moving to the city of Calgary will have assured a job for them waiting at the equivalent wage, equivalent level of those already working here. That's an expensive promise. It's also a utopian promise. It's unrealizable. When you get a document like that, Nahid, that's governing the entire planning of the city of Calgary uh, for 100 years, I think we're in serious trouble. And so we could actually solve some infrastructure problems if we would get revision the city away from this kind of document. This is something that works in the halls of Mount Royal University. It's not something that works on the streets of Calgary. And we really need to be careful that we don't uh, go off on these flights of fancy and put all this fancy language into the visioning documents and then come up short on maintenance for facilities, maintenance for street and sewer, uh, all of these things that have to be replaced on a regular basis. Is that... Uh, you have 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, so I think we need to look at a new visioning document for Calgary. 
we need to replace Imagine Calgary 100 with a new document, and that's called Imagine Calgary Unblundered. It rhymes, but we really have to undo some of the things that are going on here, or we are going to go so far into debt, especially if the greenhouse gas uh, report of Pembina is imp implemented, it'll cost us billions, and you are going to be the ones paying for it. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Norm Perot. Norm, this question's for you. Calgary is a city that is growing quite quickly. Do you see having to raise taxes with all the infrastructure needs? No, actually, I believe that the taxes can be dropped by 15% now, and quite likely 20 or more percent. The money that is being wasted, it's almost criminal. The thing is, we can get far better value for our dollar, like I'd explained before. The thing is, like the Peace Bridge, for his, just as an example, why did it go out of country? We have engineers, designers, everything here, and they know how to weld things for our temperatures. They don't, because that's in uh, Spain, that's why it had to all be re-welded. That cost apparently $7 million, and that was uh, another one of these backroom hidden deals, what I understand, I might be wrong, but... Um, uh, so, you know, we need to get uh, people that can do the job right, better value for your dollar, and not allow things to go out of country because you can't do a paper trail. Where's the money really going? And to who? So, you know, you need to think between the lines when you're listening to people talk because there's a lot of messages that you can pick up on. Being an orator is, is fine, but the thing is, there's a percentage of it is hot air. Now, 30 seconds. If, if, uh, if you're going to be paying these atrocious taxes, and like I said before, it's more than half of your dollar earned with all the compounded taxes, everything else, if I get to be mayor, I will drop taxes significantly and get more done, better quality, for far less. Thank you. Uh, that's it for the groupie answers. Uh, Nahed Enchi wants to rebut. Anyone else? No? Uh, go ahead. I think it's important to understand uh, very well the tax situation uh, in the city. So eight cents of every dollar you pay in taxes goes to the municipal government. 92 cents goes to the federal and provincial governments. With that eight cents, we have to provide police, fire, parks, recreation, transit, roads, uh, and a whole variety of other services. So it's easy to say we should just cut back. You always hear these talk about wasteful spending. No one ever has any examples of it. But it's easy to say we need to cut back. But I don't want to live in a world where you can't have a fire on Sunday because there's no firefighters available on Sundays. Uh, or where clean water is only available for 18 hours a day, not 24 hours a day. The fact is we've got to provide these services every day and we don't have the tools in which to do it. The property tax is a horrible way to tax people. You can never keep up with infrastructure. But this famous $52 million, did you know that the province cut the city's capital grant by $150 million in the same budget that they left $50 million on the table. So we had no choice but to invest in things like the refurbishment of Bob the Hand Pool using that money. Okay, thank you, Nahed. Um, John, you want to? Okay. Uh, John Lord, you have uh, one minute. Well, you certainly had a choice, and you made a choice to keep the money that the province gave to the city to give back to these people, their families, you took it right out of their pockets. What do you think about someone, if you had given them $10 to give to someone else, and that person in the middle decided to keep the money for themselves, even though it had been entrusted to them to give to someone else, what would you think about their character? You had a choice. You made a choice that I feel, and many feel, lacks integrity. So at the end of the day, yes, there's lots of opportunities. He said there was, you know, give me an example of wasteful spending at City Hall. There's, he said there's no examples. Are you kidding me? We see it everywhere. We, we see it everywhere. One example, a bridge that cost $30 million, probably more, where we sent a large part of that money outside of the city. What's wrong with Calgary talent? 
What's wrong with our Calgary kids when it comes to artists? Why couldn't we have used people in Calgary to do this? Thank you. Thank you, John. And anyone else care to use the rebuttal trump card? No. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, we're going to move on to the next round, which is the group A group of uh, answer people answering. That's going to start with Milan Papez, uh, John. Oh, excuse me. It's going to start with Nahed Nenshi, then John Lord, then Milan Papez. Uh, the question is, uh, Mr. Nenshi, if you are to be elected mayor of Calgary, how will you find the financial resources to help with repairing all of the flood damage in our city? Again, a terrific question, um, and certainly not from wasteful spending, because the example he gave, A, we didn't spend extra money on that, and B, it wasn't property tax money. So you, if you're looking for wasteful spending, I'm still waiting uh, for real examples of that. But the point is that we need to be able to fix the flood damage. The flood damage at the city of Calgary, to the city alone, to things like parks and roads and pathways, was half a billion dollars. It's more money than we've spent on any project in the city except for the West LRT and one wastewater treatment plant. And certainly insurance will cover part of that. Grants from the provincial and federal government will cover other parts of it. Um, but experience has shown us when na there's natural disasters that the municipality, the city, is left holding about 10 to 20 percent of the total cost. And we've got to figure out the right way to finance that. So this year, that $52 million, it wasn't give you $10 and keep some of it. It was we were going to give you 20, now we're only giving you 11. <laughs> and how much do you want to pass on? So the real issue here is that, that $52 million we spent on things that no insurance and no province or federal government will ever spend, like not charging people to go to the landfill to bring their flood damaged goods, like waiving property tax on people whose uh, properties were damaged. These are things we got to do. And I hate to tell you this, but ultimately all of the money for the flood repair, all $6 billion in Alberta, is coming from taxpayers. That's the only source we have. So when I say we're going to the province or federal government, it's still us paying. And it's a shame. And when we say we're going to the insurance companies, we pay it in higher insurance premiums. But we nonetheless have to be able to fix all this stuff. We don't have a choice. You know, we have to get the pathway system back up. We've got to get the roads back up. We had to already uh, repair the C-train and keep it going. So at the end of the day, we have to take communal responsibility for that and say this is public infrastructure that every single one of us use and that we all have to come together and pay for. Thank you, Nahe. John Lord, John Lord, your question is, uh, if you are to become mayor of Calgary, how will you find the financial resources to help with repairing all of the flood damage? We have a real challenge in Calgary dealing with this flood. And there have been five of these floods in the last 140 years. So you could say, on average, we're going to get one every 30 years or so. So this is a really serious issue that needs to be addressed. But the city doesn't have any money really to address it. We're already at pretty much 80% of our debt ceiling. We have expenses in every direction, and we don't have a lot of money to deal with this flood uh, issue, which is ultimately, if we don't deal with it, it's going to cost billions and billions of dollars the next time it happens, and that could be as early as next year. Guess who's going to pay for all of that? Your futures. So this is, this is an issue that simply must be addressed. And how are we going to find the money? Well, my first motion, my first motion at City Hall was I looked at the light bulbs everywhere back then and I said you can replace those with higher tech light bulbs and ballast and save 70% of your electrical costs. Multiply it by hundreds of buildings in the city of Calgary, it's big dollars. It saved a hundred million dollars in fact. That one initiative idea alone. So up to that point we were wasting electricity. He says there's no examples of waste at City Hall. We were wasting electricity to the tune of $100 million until I brought that motion and everybody looked at it, they studied it and realized I was right, and we did it. And there's so many more ideas like that. And that was back when we were spending about a third of what we're, a half to a, um, a third of what we're spending now. You don't think there's opportunities to save money at City Hall? Well, get a small businessman of over 30 years like myself who's had to watch the pennies the principles are the same. The zeros get bigger, but the principles are the same. Watch your pennies, they become dollars in government, they become millions 
and millions of dollars. And that's where we're going to find the money. We're going to get all these savings that we can have at City Hall, and we're going to use that for flood relief and many other things that we need, like soccer fields, uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Milan Papez, if you are to I come, if personally you to... believe that the uh, city shouldn't be punished for uh, floods because this wasn't our fault. It was a fault of the province because province two and a half years ago received a warning from University of Saskatchewan who does a study in Karanaskis telling that flood may happen any time right now. And province totally ignored that warning. Besides that, if we would have installed the equipment to predict the floods, the cloud which was actually coming from United States, from United States, uh, was uh, actually three days uh, when it crossed the Saskatchewan, three days to get to the mountains. So if we would be predicting the floods, we had uh, three days to prepare for this flood. So three days were gone because we got a warning after the flood has happened. And uh, flood was so bad, and nobody really even knows it because the water or cloud, the water has so much energy because it was too warm. It came from central United States where it was very warm and traveled across the Colorado. So actually this flood was fueled by fires in Colorado because heat up this water, and when it came to the mountains, we would also know that there is a two feet of the snow, but we didn't know that. And the warm water, which has so much energy, fell down and melted the water uh, from the snow in a matter of the minutes instead of day or two. That's why we were shocked that the water was coming to the city and nobody still don't understand that it, this was because the, we have too much snow and we didn't have any equipment to predict the flood. We used to have it, and province, even today, if today is going to happen the flood, it's going to happen again without a warning. Because no city council, no the province has done anything to predict the flood. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. Uh, that's it for the Group A round of answers. Uh, Norm, I know, wants to, to rebut here. Uh, go ahead, Norm Perot. Yeah, I predicted the flood two weeks before it happened, and now they're all trying to make fun of me because they didn't know, which makes them envious, I guess. The unnecessary flood, it would not have, wouldn't it have been better to predict the flood and mitigate it before it happened? There are a lot of witnesses to verify that I predicted the flood two weeks before it happened. If you want names of these people, I'll provide them later. It, you know, why it, it happened how bad it would be, and how to prevent it. Could have saved billions of dollars in untold misery. The stampede ground, the downtown, and most of the house would not have been flooded. I also wore hip waders and went and helped people during the flood. I never seen a single politician there, but the hot air was probably adding to melt the snow, which added to the flood. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Uh, no other rebuttals? Okay. Uh, this is, we're moving to the Group B round of uh, answers here. This will be the last Group B round, the last group round in this uh, round of questioning. Um, we're going to start now with uh, Norm Perot. We're starting with you, and then we're going to then have Larry Heather and Carter Thompson. So, Norm, uh, this question's for you. Calgary's downtown skate park is not always accessible or safe for young people from across the city of Calgary. If you're elected mayor, would you develop more skate parks in our city? Yes, there's a... Uh, oh, just the microphone, Norm. Yeah, great. Thank yes, you. Yes, there's actually a lot of the uh, schools that have been shut down. There's one across the street from me. It's the R.B. Bennett. It just sits there. And then they're saying, oh, we don't have schools. We don't have this. We don't have that. Common sense, like, you know, let's use some of these places. It is only used some evenings and rarely on a weekend for soccer and baseball. There could be, a and it's a very, very large area in the schoolyard. So yes, there's a lot of places where they could build skate parks, a lot of, even build them so that they can drop poles in and have badminton, all kinds of things. You know, again, 
common sense and working together. If everybody comes up with ideas and we work towards a goal, things can get accomplished. But people seem to be afraid to work together and think of things to find solutions to unnecessary problems. Just like, for example, dandelions, they see it as a, as a weed, as a problem. I see it as a salad. It's a totally edible plant. You can actually eat the roots, stem, leaves, flower. You can even make wine with that, but I shouldn't be telling you guys that. So, and you know, a lot of these things are just, think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Uh, Larry Heather, you're next up here. Larry, Calgary's downtown skate park is not always accessible or safe for young people from across Calgary. If you're elected mayor, would you develop more skate parks in our city? I just don't want to neglect saying hi to all those students, thousands of students out in uh, closed circuit TV land. We thank you for participating and taking an interest. And if there are any, if this group of students in, at Ian Bazalgad is any, uh, any uh, indication of the future, this is good. I haven't seen one of them twittering, and uh, they're engaged. They're listening. They're interested, and you just can't do policy by twittering. It's you get into a lot of trouble. So skate parks, skate parks. Uh, the sports policy, again, is overly expansive, so the facilities are being uh, neglected because they've got so many balls in the air. If you read that document from 2005, it has to be redone because we are starting to neglect our facilities. But there's a sense in which there's extreme sports, so how many people actually get hurt by skateboarding? Is it, how safe is it? Is there risk being taken in all sorts of sports that could put your future at risk? And is that related to the teaching of evolution that says we're just a chance thing here? We just happened rather than a special, being a special creation of God. So the type of risk you take during sports, if it affects the entire future, if you become a quadriplegic from taking unnecessary risks, I think that's a danger. So. We need to revision this whole area and provide things that we're not staking our future on. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Carter Thompson. Carter, uh, Calgary's downtown skate park is not always accessible or safe for young people across the city of Calgary. If you're elected mayor, would you develop more skate parks in our city? Boarding has, has become a, a mode of transportation, and thanks to the responsible boarding of our young people, we've seen its proliferation. You're no longer ostracized. You're no longer harassed by the police. You're respected as, uh, as using a conveyance safely and uh, wisely with uh, other users of pathways. So downtown is a great place for that, that park. That's easily the most accessible with transit because, uh, of course, transit works best if you are going downtown. Existing places where, like uh, a schoolyard, where we could build a park and partner, and, you know, that's a perfect place to put up a Quonset type structure for other all-age venues that we can be very practical with. Like the farmers have out, they put on big pieces of equipment, we can be smart, we can have our skateboard parks and we can have all-age venues nearby that it will be easily maintained for, for less money. And thanks to your guys' responsibility, boarding is, is an awesome form of transportation. Thanks. Thank you, Carter. Any, any rebuttals for this last round? Any rebuttals? No? Okay. All right. Moving on to the third round of questioning now. We're moving on to the next round. Uh, in this round, Ian Basil Jet students have come up with the two questions candidates that they're going to be asking you. Each candidate gets to respond to each question. So all six of you will get to go twice here. Uh, you'll have two minutes to respond in this round. Again, Will will give you the 30-second notice, and then the second bell means it's time to wrap up. Again, these are questions from Ian Basil Jet students. Who would like to go first? <laughs> They're both pointing at each other here. <laughs> S stand up and introduce yourself, please. And Hi, my then, name is uh, Suhair. Yeah. Um, since Forest Lawn and the Southeast are considered less advantaged districts, what is your plan for revitalization of these areas? Uh, we, sorry, we're going to reverse the order, so we'll start at Norm, just because we did the, the opening remarks started at Larry's end of the table. So Norm, why don't you go first? You have two minutes. Could I get the question repeated, please? 
Since Forest Lawn and Southeast are considered less advantaged districts, what is your plan for revitalizing of these areas? Actually, it's not just Forest Lawn. I'm in Bone Ass. But anyway, the, uh, I guess with the uh, revitalizing things, it's uh, allowing and building facilities for everyone to enjoy, especially the young people because they really should be staying in shape. If they uh, can beat granny, way to go. But again, skate parks, hockey, I've had my three boys in hockey and soccer and baseball. Um, there's, as I say, a lot of areas that are just sitting idle, a lot of it. And I think that it could be brought to fruition with very little to no money. So it's not a matter of City Hall having to put out millions or billions or whatever. It's a matter of, again, using what's there, making do with what we have, which, I don't know, seems to be kind of a lost art nowadays. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Uh, John Lord, you're up next. Uh, Suhara, can you please repeat the question just for the candidate so he's aware? Okay. Since Forest Lawn and Southeast are considered less advantaged districts, what is your plan for revitalizing these areas? What a great question, and especially for me. I said, you know, um, much is uh, said about how my worthy opponent is such a great talker, and he is. He really is a great talker. I'm more of a doer, and preferably, I'm more of a listener. I was really hoping in this forum I'd get a chance to hear from you and what concerns you and your questions, so I'm, I'm pleased to see this. In terms of revitalization, I have a long track record of proof of what I can do and have done. I started a small group in a, in a rundown disadvantaged district in Calgary uh, some 30 years ago. I organized the small businesses. They were all very skeptical. We named it the Marta Loop, and we, I put thousands of volunteer hours into it. And slowly but surely, we turned that whole district around, and now it's one of the very best communities in Calgary to live, work, and play. And you know, then I took that, that experience, that success of revitalizing uh, that whole community, and it took, it took dozens and hundreds of people, really. Uh, but I had organized the first street festival, Martin Loop Summer Festival, first one in Alberta. Everyone else used it as a model, so now we have Lilac Fest and Sun and Salsa and so many others. I said, and then the BRZ movement got going because people could see that this is turning communities around. So I became the founding chairman of the Alberta Federation of Business Revitalization Zones, transforming communities right across the province back then. And then I started the uh, Victoria Crossing. That's, that's time? 30 seconds. Okay. So I started, as alderman, we started the Victoria Crossing community association to deal with Victoria Park, which was a hugely disadvantaged community. It's turning it around. You can do this. I've done it now for almost 30 years. If you want to turn around Forest Lawn, I know how to get that done. And we can point to so many examples I worked on before. You know, these are all terrific ideas you don't have to guess about. It can be done. Forest Lawn does need some attention. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, so you've asked a question one hour and 40 minutes too early. Um, but no one's paying any attention and there's no press in the room, so I'll just tell you that uh, at noon today, uh, along with Alderman Chabot and Alderman Kara, uh, who are the aldermen for this area, I will be announcing my plan to build an even better forest lawn. Uh, and I'm very excited about the potential here. There are great plans for 17th Avenue, there have been for a long time, for 17th Avenue Southeast to become a really major shopping, retail, uh, a real jewel street for the community. But these plans have never been accomplished. The city has never had a lot of time and attention focused on 17th Avenue Southeast. So at noon, I'll be announcing a plan to work with the province to jointly fund a number of improvements in Forest Lawn along 17th Avenue, the biggest one of which is the creation of a dedicated busway, a transit way, uh, connecting Forest Lawn to the rest of the city, as well as major improvements along the street. Forest Lawn is a terrific neighborhood. I grew up in Greater Forest Lawn in Marlborough, and certainly 
it is better than people think it is in the rest of the community. Uh, much, much better. I took an out-of-town visitor up and down 17th Avenue, and I was showing him my plans and what I wanted to do here. And when he finished the tour, he looked at me, a guy who's lived all over the world, and he was kind of unimpressed, and he said, the street with the brand new Target and all the construction is the street that you think is a horrible street that needs to get fixed? It's actually doing great uh, by world standards, but it can be much better. And um, I think that investing there by ensuring that we've got the right kind of recreation and cultural facilities as well as transit that really works well in this part of the neighborhood will be the catalyst for further development. And uh, I, I, I applaud John. The work he did in the Marta Loop BRZ was a real beginning of a lot of that work. And we'll be working with the Forest Lawn, the International Avenue BRZ uh, to make these investments. And you'll see real changes in this neighborhood uh, over the next few years as long as the province agrees. Thank you. Carter Thompson, you're next. Uh, Sue Hare, could you just read the question again, please? Just remind everyone. Thank you. Since Forest Lawn and Southeast are considered less advantaged districts, what is your plan for revitalizing these areas? Well, our first house that we bought was in West Dover, a short walk across the lights and kind of over. All three of my sons were born there, and uh, we played here. And I don't, I never felt disadvantaged. It was home, everywhere we went. Our, our friends are everywhere. We supported the local business. Um, we, would, we would easily get on the bike path. We would ride down by Inglewood Bird Sanctuary and we had the bike path and we could be downtown on our bikes. And uh, all over the city I see communities taking back their community. If there's issues with safety and security, Utilize the police resources. We will not be bullied. We will not let thugs run our life and our neighborhoods. We will take them back. So for the whole city, I think the thing applies. Uh, for personal safety, security, and enjoyment of our city, we'll just keep moving forward and do our best with the resources we have for all. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. Go ahead, Sue Hare. Since Forest Lawn and Southeast are considered less advantaged districts, what is your plan for revitalizing these areas? Milan Papas. I am not very familiar with the recent Forest Lawn, but I remember in the past. But what I am hearing from the present time, I think that a major issue is to eliminate the crime from Forest Lawn. This uh, prevents the businesses to come here and expand which means we got very limited uh, amount of the businesses which are very vital element for the forest lawn. Second thing is, again, transportation. Transportation is almost impossible in here. We got the buses going through which are not exactly to the favor of the people living in the forest lawn. So the transportation would be a second issue. And uh, I believe that this building of uh, uh, development going east from the Calgary in this area, we probably could consider to run a sea train line to the forest land, connect the forest land with the uh, rest of the city, because kind of problem of the forest land is this kind of isolated community. You cannot, you are blocked from the, you are blocked from the north, you are blocked from the east and uh, from the west. So it needs to get connected and I think that that would be the most important thing for the forest land because they to my opinion okay they living the people from variety of ethnic groups and as together when they put on the show of uh, any kind within any community ethnic community it's a beautiful place to socialize with the people of variety of ethnic communities in forest land and all we needed to really improve the situation which is in the forest land. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. And the last answer on this question is coming from Larry Heather. I would just say it's so important, the imaging of a community, what the standards are. Uh, in terms of community policing, it is unfortunate that law enforcement officials have joined too quickly in campaigns of decriminalizing so-called harmless behavior, even though it is obvious that public drunkenness, 
drug taking, street prostitution, and pornographic displays can destroy a community more quickly than any team of professional burglars. You know, you have these dysfunctional men going down the street using prostitutes, many of whom are new immigrant women to Canada and being exploited, and others are being recruited out of our very schools here by people promising them, the pimps promising them a, a career in modeling or something else, and they very uh, easily exploit the weakness here. And the cash starts to flow. It does. All of a sudden, you find these people that got money for things that you couldn't imagine, and you wonder where that came from. We should continue to extend the implementation of what we call safe and clean neighborhood policy via the broken window theory of law enforcement. That's when, uh, if one window in a community is left broken and it's there for months, it gets kind of a permission slip. You know, you, you need a permission slip to, to get out of class. Well, it's giving criminals a permission slip to come in and, and be, uh, be uh, unorderly, maybe do a little stealing, this or that. Uh, so we have to realize that we must restore the long neglected view that police ought to protect both individuals and community standards because the lowest common denominator of community standards attracts the wrong kind of traffic, the wrong kind of people to your community. That scares people away when they're looking to rent or buy a house or establish a business. We must restore the standards and Forest Lawn will again thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, we have another question coming from one of the students here at Ian Basil Jett. Um, we'll just reverse the order again. So, Larry, that means you're first up, then Milan Carter, uh, Nahed, John, and Norm. And uh, go ahead. Okay, so, my name is Faith, and my question is do you, feel like, do you feel that the legalization of secondary suites would be advantageous to reduce city sprawl and assist, and assist those who cannot afford home ownership? Go ahead, Larry. Uh, first of all, I do not support the legalization of secondary suites citywide. They're already zoned for certain areas. Uh, like inclusionary zoning in new apartments, this type of economic desegregation actually denies people buying a house a choice to live in areas which have the distinct advantages of R1 zoning. Lacking this in Calgary, they will flee to the bedroom communities that still provide such an option with the resultant loss of our property tax base. Families naturally resist a sort of backdoor social engineering. The original promise to the existing owners of an R1 zone is violated when the city goes and changes that, and it's really a broken covenant. It, being, it begins a cycle of distrust of homeowners, property, payers, and it activates a flight response which makes housing in Calgary worse. We must realize that secondary suite zones have a high transient, higher transient population who are not really normally invested. If they're here in Calgary for construction for a couple years, they're not going to join the community association. They're not going to look to the long-term health of your community. So the higher the, that is, the harder it is to really feel that citizens uh, with, with the crowded parking, some of our lots are not even uh, 50 meters wide. And you need 50 meters to park four cars. Now what, do you, what if you get a 30 meter lot and uh, what if the original owner uh, actually moves somewhere else and puts a, another uh, renter in his side of the duplex, let's say, then you have a, a large growing of population that might not be committed to the long-term health of the community. This is a complicated issue, but the policies of the city are actually making it worse and making housing more scarce. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, next up is Milan Papas, but Faith, could you just remind everyone the question again, please? Do you feel that the legalization of secondary suites would be advantageous to reduce city sprawl and assist those who cannot afford home ownership? I, 
looking at the situation that the uh, city uh, is in a shortage of the accommodation for the people and uh, obviously legalization of the street would be perfect answer and quick answer but i don't think so we should take it that quickly because what's going to happen every time in the history of calgary whenever we increase uh, density in any area we faced in other problems there is many problems but number one problem was actually schools we start to overcrowd the schools once once we increase the density in the area and second thing was the parking there was nowhere to park and we create expenses especially for the taxpayers with the parking and schools we have to build the schools and there were never been funds to expand the schools in areas when we increase the density. Nobody planned with that. So what I'm trying to say, if we're going to legalize the streets, we have to make sure that we have adequate schools and we have enough parking in the area. Because then accidents happen. When it's too many cars in the street, uh, people get run over. And we have to make sure that we're going to protect uh, especially our education and we're going to protect uh, people from accidents. And uh, that is something which we cannot do it outright. Beside that, there are some districts which cannot be accommodated with secondary suites. And we don't even think about it. Uh, we're going to do we're going to approve it, and then we're going to create a catastrophe. So we have to put this evaluation to the areas when we're going to provide the secondary suites. And besides that, I truly believe that people of the district should have something to say to that if they want a secondary suite or not. Because then minority will dictate to majority. That's my opinion. Thank you, Milan. <laughs> Carter Thompson, you're up next. Uh, Faith, if you don't mind. Do you feel that the legalization of secondary suites would be advantageous to reduce city sprawl and assist those who cannot afford home ownership? Thank you, Faith. That is a, that's a great question. Secondary suites, where we can put them, will help but only put a very small dent in the problem of our affordable housing situation. We really need to address that we could get some affordable housing in the new districts to start with. But that being said, the first place I lived in Calgary was in an illegal fourplex. So I was in the basement of a, of a duplex and I had no control over the heat and it was 30 below and the guys upstairs weren't home. And I remember I sort of cut the wires on the furnace, furnace thermometer and spliced them together and turned the heat on full blast. And Oops, I left the next day to go to work and forgot to give the control back and we had a Chinook and the guys upstairs were boiling. So we need to be smart and have some kind of an arrangement with perhaps using electric heat or a gas heater in the places. We need to make sure that they're safe. We need to make sure that people can get out of them. So we're in a bit of a quandary now because now we're going to involve City Hall and it's massive red tape to get anything done. The guys in the, in the three million dollar houses that want to put a mother-in-law suite in, they're not even going to bother going to City Hall. The contractor trucks are going to roll up, those jobs are paid for, and they just put it in, boom. And, and it's not doing anything to help affordable housing, they're just using that for themselves. So we think about affordable housing as secondary suites, we have to really knuckle down and do it smart. So, so let's figure out a way, let's figure out a way to do it. Thanks you guys. Thank you, Carter. <laughs> I was going to ask if you wanted to get or not, but... Yeah, it's all right. Thank you for the question, Faith. Uh, I will tell you that in my three years as mayor, my single biggest failure uh, was the failure to be able to legalize secondary suites across the city. Uh, you've heard a lot of important things today, and what I will just say is that in addition to helping with sprawl, in addition to helping with affordable housing, which are the things in your question, I think we've got a moral and an ethical requirement to act. We know that there are between 35,000 and 50,000 illegal suites in this city. And like Carter, the people who were living in them, who are living in them, have no legal recourse. If their landlord is abusing them, if there's mice, if there's mold, if the fire alarm doesn't work, if there's no heat, they have nowhere to complain to. Because if they complain to the city, the only thing we can do is rip out their cabinets and their stove and kick them out of their house. Who's ever going to do that? 
we actually have a system where we've said as a community, it's okay that these folks, lots of folks who are just starting out, lots of folks who need more affordable housing, it's okay if they live without the same legal rights that all the rest of us enjoy. And I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. And so I believe that we have to legalize these suites across the city and regulate them for safety and make sure that everyone has a safe and a decent place to live. Every, every city in Canada, except for Calgary and Burnaby, British Columbia, have done this already. And we haven't seen neighborhoods totally change and transient renters and unpleasant people. Because remember today, you could rent your whole house to a university fraternity or a bike gang if you wanted to. But if you want to rent it to a student or a senior, or if you are a senior who wants someone to live in the house to keep an eye on the lawn and, mow and shovel the snow, but you want them to have their own stove, we say that that's illegal. I think that's wrong. Uh, and if I am re-elected, I will go to council again uh, and suggest that it is finally time for us to make sure that everyone has a safe and a decent place to live. Thank you, Nahed. John, you okay? Well, thank you for that question, Faith. And, uh, you know, I think this serves as a perfect example of the major differences between my worthy opponent and myself. He talks so charmingly about the things that we all want. We all want affordable housing for you. But at the end of the day, what gets done is what counts. And what's happening with affordable housing? He's now proposing a $4,800 increase on the cost of new young families trying to buy a starter home. He's driving up the cost of buying a house, which is going to increase the need for things like secondary suites and other forms of affordable housing. And I congratulate him for, for admitting that he hasn't made much headway on that issue. Let me tell you what I've done, though. I started a crusade when I first was elected to, to legalize secondary suites because I recognized and I, I knew there was tens of thousands of young people just like yourselves who were teenagers who were going to be moving out of their houses soon and they were going to need a lot of affordable housing. And the only solution that I could see was to legalize basement suites. But they could not be legalized back then because the legislation did not exist in the Alberta building codes. Couldn't possibly, no matter how nice he built them. So when I became MLA, that became my first priority. I asked for and got a committee that was really unpopular. No one wanted to sit on it. It was a hot potato. But we, we moved forward. We got basement suites legalized under the building code so that we could legalize basement suites. And Edmonton and Red Deer and cities all across the province did it right away, just not Calgary. So I had to run for mayor to get the job finished in Calgary. And he did not get the job finished. I didn't get elected. I said, we do not need to force secondary suites onto unwilling communities by imperial decree. We could create secondary suites all over the city in new subdivisions. And I was instrumental in bringing that legislation forward. The city of Calgary, it's now legal to build them in all new subdivisions. We could build them by the tens of thousands, okay. but he's closing down new subdivisions. Thank you, Mr. Lord. Uh, la last but not least on this issue is uh, Norm Perot. Hold the mic, Norm. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. As far as secondary suites, um, I've been building duplexes, and they are handicap friendly, by the way. I'm a contractor and an inventor. And as far as uh, this thing about electricity and rig in a furnace that Carter referred to, it can be uh, resolved by having hydronic heating or radiant heat. Because you can have zone uh, thermostats in a different locations in the house. And each thermostat is connected to a zone valve which gives you heat in that particular area. I've invented a three-way system on one loop in my house 13 years ago. That technology still is not out there. So the first thing, being a builder, is safety. You've heard horror stories of people burning in basements. They couldn't get out because of bars on windows, things like that. So safety has to be the ultimate determining factor. 
the next one is affordability, of course. And safety is, shouldn't really be taken for granted because there are serious consequences to that as I've just dwelt on. Now, parking is another problem. And again, there's areas where they can make parking for secondary suites, but they might have to walk a little bit, a block or two. But it's all doable, again, if we work together and use common sense. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Suhair. Thank you, Faith, for the questions. Um, uh, great questions. Uh, so this is the closing statement round, guys. We're going to reverse the order yet again. So that means that, uh, Norm, you're going to be starting the closing statements. Uh, candidates, it's only one minute. One minute, half the time to wrap up, OK? Um, Will, you good to go? All right. So uh, Norm, is closing statement. Go right ahead. Money wasting isn't new. We need to know the financial costs up front of, and, and no excuses later. I'll give you examples. Like in the past, the convention center went three and a half times over budget. We didn't learn from that mistake. So now I hear the West LRT is a half a billion over budget. Landfill costs, which were referred to earlier, um, they're very high. But apparently this money was spent um, on landfill. Well, I thought the landfill was owned by the city, and they get the money for it. So what we're doing is we're making a circle with the money, but they end up with the money and use excuses to do it. Taxpayers should have access to the financial books. It's our money, less backroom deals. Let's start to work together and find out where it's being misspent. You know, hot air doesn't cut it. Thank you. Thank or you any more excuses. Thank you, Norm. Uh, John Lord, closing remarks or remembers? Just one minute, guys. One minute. Okay. Well, I think that young people and families uh, are just so important in our entire future. I've spent most of my life working both as volunteer and in government on your behalf. And I said right from the beginning, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for you and your futures. And I want you to have the best start in life and not be saddled with a lifetime of high taxes and debt and no opportunities so that you have to move elsewhere. The cost of living in Calgary is going through the roof. The cost of buying a new starter home is going through the roof. In Edmonton, where they're growing just about as fast as Calgary, the prices are stable. The cost of new starter homes is actually coming down. So what's the difference? What's happening? It's the ideology at City Hall that, that thought this would be a better way to go, but it just isn't working. Unintended consequences. I said, you know, I truly believe that my opponent is passionate, dedicated, and committed to wanting to have a better city. It's just that I don't believe that where he's going is actually going to create that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Go ahead, Nancy. Thanks very much, uh, uh, everyone. I realized that I, I didn't do something that uh, I like to do with crowds, which is um, Instagram. So. There we go, panorama feature, ready to go. All right, oh, now it's too slow, I'm wasting my minute. Wave. Thank you. So I can remember. The reason I did that, the reason I did that is because I, don't, I want to remember the people for whom we do this work. And that is every one of you. Your families came here from every corner of the world, and you came here to the best place in the world to have great opportunity for your families and for yourselves. And that's why we do this work. And we have to remember that when we have conversations about things like taxes and investments, we have to remember that you get it back every single day. You get it back in great public services. You get it back in a safe city, a city where you can be great and live a great life. And that's what this is all about. That's why I'm running for mayor, and I hope that you will all support me. Thank you. Thank you. Carter Thompson. Thanks, folks. There's lots of stuff broke at City Hall. When things are broke, who are you going to call to fix it? Are you going to call your dad or your grandpa, or are you going to call your teacher? Vote for John Lord. His, when John Lord was in, this was an important device right here. Voting for John Lord would be like voting for Bert for mayor of Sesame Street. 
in our McHappy city, I will be Mr. Mayor McCheese, and I still have a spot for Nahid. He can be Grimace. Thank you. Next up for closing statements, which are getting more and more interesting, Milan Papez. Actually, I am uh, considering the most important thing to change the city politics. We're complaining that we paying too high taxes and we're wasting $300 million on the tunnel which leads to the field of the sour gas wells. Nowhere else, we're not gonna build there for another 100 years for sure. But we have six lane tunnel going that way. We don't have one going north of Andirfoot or south of Andirfoot or Croftchild. So we have to change the politics. We don't have a short term strategy for controlling the traffic on Deerfoot and Croftchild. We don't have nothing. There is no political position. Uh, what are we going to do with our traffic? We have so many cars in the car, in Calgary, that we cannot put basically any more cars in here. And we have no strategy what we're going to do. And that's my major issue in uh, city politics. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. <laughs> Larry Heather. In terms of social harmony in the city, our race is no matter what color we have as a skin color is unchangeable. It's a God-given gift to us and we should celebrate it. But a religion can be inadequate to the task at hand that we as candidates face. Both Christianity and Islam are multiracial faiths. But I think it's important that the values of the book that a mayor swears in on must produce a basis for maintaining a Western democracy. Worldwide dictatorships oppressive to both women, children, and minorities are the rule of the day in many areas. And this horrific results fill the news channels of our nightly news broadcast, and you see it on the internet as well. So I just encourage you, get back, get back, get back to where this country once belonged. I, Larry Heather, by God's favor, seek to be your 36th mayor of Calgary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. So we had, a, we had a McDonald's reference, we had a Beatles reference, we had an Instagram photograph and the closing arguments. It's been, yeah, you guys, are, you guys are great. Oh, what was that? The good guy. <laughs> thank you so much for all coming this morning. A uh, big thank you to Livestream Calgary for enabling the, uh, the live streaming cast across the city so students and other schools could listen in this morning. Uh, thank you to Will on the bell. Big round for Will. He did a great job today. Awesome work, buddy. Awesome work. Thank you, Sue Hare and Faith. You guys did a great job with your questions today. Uh, thank you to Youth Central for coordinating this. Thank you to Ian Basiljet School. You guys are awesome. Uh, thank you, most of all, to our candidates today. I'm going to go across the table just one final time so you know who each person is. Starting on uh, stage left, Larry Heather, Milan Papez, Carter Thompson, Nahed Nenshi, John Lloyd, and Norm Perot at the end of the table. Thank you so much this morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ted Henley from Breakfast Television. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. Had a great time. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> students, stay seated. Students, stay seated, please. Um, for I know our friends from the news media here in town, guys, they're arranging a room for you guys to do the candidate interviews if you want. So uh, just hang tight for that. Sure.